Good evening. I'm Anuj Mehrotra. I'm the Dean of the George Washington School of Business. I'm delighted to welcome you to this special session of George Talks Business, a series of conversations on a weekly basis with business leaders on topics of timely interest. Today, we are hosting a George Talks Business held in conjunction with the 19th Robert P. Maxson Lecture. The Maxson Lecture Series is provided by the Institute for Corporate Responsibility at the School of Business at George Washington University. Our guest today is Manoj Saxena, Executive Chairman of Cognitive Scale and the Founding Managing Director of the Entrepreneurs Fund 4, a seed fund focused on B2B AI market with nine active investments. Previously, Manoj served as the first general manager of IBM Watson, where his team built the first cognitive systems. Prior to IBM, Manoj successfully founded and sold two venture-backed software companies within a five-year period. He currently serves on the boards of AI Global, a nonprofit dedicated to promoting practical and responsible applications of AI, and the Saxena Family Foundation. Manoj earned his MBA from Michigan State University, which I believe reached the final four in the NCA tournament, and a master's degree in management sciences from the Birla Institute of Technology and Science, Pilani, in India. He is also a holder of 14 software patents. I have known Manoj for over three decades to be professionally passionate, asking the intriguing, often difficult questions. I've always found him to be ahead of the others in his thinking and challenging the status quo. That has probably served him very well in making impactful contributions right from his first startup to the Watson Project, and now being among the earliest voices in shaping our inevitable reliance on AI and helping figure out the appropriate, responsible way of how to understand, impact, and ensure that technology and our values as humanity are in sync. I am delighted and honored that he is here today to share his thoughts. A brief presentation will be followed by some Q&A. Please join me in welcoming Manoj Saxena. Well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for that introduction. It's my honor to be here today with you at this uh, fine institution and uh, to discuss a topic, like uh, Anuj said, uh, which is going to get increasingly important to us, uh, both as uh, individuals and as society. And I think there's no better place than the nation's capital for us to be having this conversation. Uh, what I'm going to share with you in the next 20, 25 minutes is uh, some prepared materials on uh, AI, kind of demystify that a little bit, and then Anuj and I are going to go into a conversation. Uh, just as a way of context, about uh, seven years ago when I was asked to run IBM Watson after the Jeopardy game, I was given the baton by the IBM board and said, go commercialize this technology. Till about two years ago, um, I used to be pretty excited and uh, quite a believer that uh, this thing is going to change the world and I'm going to be leaving behind a great legacy uh, for my family to celebrate. But about two years ago, I started changing my mind about that, uh, particularly sort of questioning the notion that I've had this naive belief that technology equals good. And uh, I think it's incredibly important for us to understand both aspects. If you thought the last elections were bad, wait till the next one happens. Uh, in terms of how technology is beginning to start both empowering us and hacking us. And uh, my prepared materials, I'm just going to start giving you some slivers of both sides of AI, and then we'll get into the discussion. Um, so you know, the first question I get asked uh, is always about, OK, what do you think about AI? There are two extreme views that are going on about AI. Uh, what is given that there is no doubt that we are at the cusp of something incredibly exciting, uh, which is equivalent to what I call as all of us having our own personal Iron Man Jarvis suits, right? So that cell phone is the beginning of a Jarvis suit. So 50 years from now, uh, our glasses, our implants, and our heart, and our phones, everything will be functioning like an Iron Man Jarvis suit for us. And if you think about it, we are actually on that journey. I gave a TED talk on this five years ago where I said, it's the end of Homo sapiens and the beginning of Homo digitalis. And that's where we are starting. And if you look at applications like Waze, that's a good example of a cognitive application. It's an application that knows you, that knows where you're trying to go, and guides you through it, understanding what's going on. Why don't I have a Waze for my financial investments? Why don't I have a Waze for my chronic diseases? That's where AI is going to take us. That's going to start augmenting 
and helping us make better decisions. And in the words of the Google CEO, he said actually that AI is going to be as impactful to humanity as fire and electricity was. And I don't think he's off base. I mean, that's certainly uh, you know, one of the seminal shifts uh, since we probably started walking as a species. And over the next 100 years, this is going to impact us. Because this is the first set of tools that we have built that are stronger than our mind. Everything else we've invented in the last few 100,000 years amplified our arms or our legs. But this is the first set of tools that are amplifying our brains. Then there is the other side of AI, which I do believe is going to also happen, that we are at the cusp of something very terrifying. You know, when most people think of AI, they either think of, oh my god, you know, I'm going to be sitting on a chair and drinking for the rest of my life and robots are going to run my life, or they will think that it's either going to kill me or take my job away. Right? That's sort of the two extremes. And another prominent person, Stephen Hawkins, has gone ahead and even said that if you don't manage this well, this could be our last big innovation uh, as a species. And that's quite a big statement coming from two luminaries. And what I would like to do over the next 20 minutes or so is go a little deeper and give you examples of how AI is both amazing innovations and AI is also artificially inflated. There are pieces of this that actually are not going to happen in our life, but the things that are happening, we need to be more mindful of it. So let's first start with what exactly is AI? It's a, it's a horrible term, actually, uh, because there's nothing artificial about AI. You know, it's all real. It's about how it impacts us as individuals and societies and families. But in a simple way, I define AI as non-biological intelligence. So far, the intelligence that we have had was all biological in nature. AI is the beginning of intelligence that's non-biological. And there are two words. There is a word on the left, which is AI from a technology perspective, is a collection of technologies, be it natural language processing, machine vision, you know, deep learning, neural networks, and, and a collection of stuff that essentially is the science and engineering of building systems that learn from patterns. Those last three words are critical, systems that learn from patterns. Because everything we have built so far have been rules-based, and rules don't learn. AI systems are pattern-based, and they learn on their own. That's what makes them exciting. That's what makes them dangerous. Right? These are like little flywheels of learning. The other side of AI is a humanistic view of AI, which are these systems that start emulating and extending human cognitive functions. Um, so what does our brain do? It senses, thinks, and acts, and it learns continuously. So we are talking about an AI system that you know, emulates and acts like a human brain. The other piece is, there's no one thing as AI. There are at least three different types of AI. I call it automated AI, augmented AI, and autonomous AI. So on one end of it is automated AI. Any task that a human brain can do in three seconds or less can already be done by a machine in a much better way. So you can replace a task using AI. On the other end, you can replace a whole human being with AI through autonomous AI, so self-driving cars and so on and so forth. In the middle, I think, is the most exciting opportunity, which is augmented AI. How do you pair humans and machines to get the intelligence at scale of a machine and then get the creativity and judgment of a human being? So when I took on IBM Watson, I started looking at the trends of how this thing came about. Uh, before IBM Watson, the big program that IBM had was Deep Blue, and which is a computer that beat Gary Kasparov at chess. Something interesting happened. 10 years after Deep Blue, the average age of a chess grandmaster fell by 12 years because people started using the computer as a coach, not as an assistant, uh, not as an opponent. So I think the augmented intelligence notion is where the exciting part is. So there are categories like robotic process automation, and I'm not going to spend too much time, but the reality is AI is evolving three different ways now, automated, augmented, and autonomous. The second part is it spans a very wide segment. You know, unfortunately, the narrative of AI is being set up by Hollywood today, right? Movies like you know, Her and Chappie and you know, that kind of stuff. Even if you ask people who are in the AI field, on average, they say it's between 100 to 500 years away. That means they themselves don't know what the heck they're talking about. So most of the value of AI is in the first two boxes, artificial narrow intelligence versus artificial general intelligence. So your spam folders, uh, where you know, it picks up your CD, your Alexa. I think when a little bit of AI applied deep into an industry is where I believe AI is going to take off. And why it's important and why it's taking off now is because of the super convergence of multiple technologies. AI is not one thing. AI is now the frontier of digital transformation. When a CEO last year spoke to me, she would say digital transformation, she would think mobile applications. 
Now when I talk to a CEO, she would say AI. That's my frontier for when she thinks digital transformation, she thinks AI. And AI is not just machine learning. One of the big myths about AI is people think AI is machine learning. 90% of the models within AI are statistical reasoning models, not machine learning models. So it's like saying my car equals a carburetor. These are subsystems that make up a car. So AI is a culmination of all these big six. It's cloud, big data, social, mobile. Blockchain is going to play an incredibly important part in AI. So when I use the word AI, I talk about a super converged infrastructure like this, not just machine learning. The other part is AI is expected to have, this is a study done by PwC that uh, says that about $15 trillion in the next 11 years is what's going to be created by AI. That's a big number. And there's a report that I will uh, I'll ask you, you know, to get. The good thing is, in the last couple of years, there's been amazing reports that have come about, and those are worth reading. So it's a substantial impact it's going to make uh, on economies. The second part is businesses are now beginning to look at AI as a game changer. One of the things, I probably did 50 such talks last year with boards and CEOs where I go in and speak to them in plain English about AI. And my opening statement to them is AI is too important to be left to technologists, right? AI is not about technology. AI is a strategic business capability, just like email was, just like spreadsheets were, just like electricity was. Imagine running your business five years from now without electricity, not being able to run your business without AI is like running a business without electricity. So they need to understand it through that lens. And I think at an institution like this, one of the opportunities and the imperatives is to start teaching your students from, you know, in my conversation that I just had with you on this whole certification program and the modularity that you're doing, I think those things are going to get even more important because these are new frontiers that require agile, consumable pieces of knowledge uh, that you all, I think, will be delivering. And, and I'm delighted to see you all take leadership in that. And just like the web transformed every business process, you know, 25 years ago when the internet came about, every business process got webified. And now with AI, every business process is going to get cognitized. Our grandchildren are going to find it funny that I had a banking application that was not smart, that it did not tell me as I opened it saying, good morning, uh, Brexit happened last night. You have four holdings in Europe. And should I call your advisor to tell them what is he doing about it? Right? I mean, we call those things smartphones. Actually, they're dumb phones. They don't do anything. Right? I have to ask it. So the AI is going to make those things smart. They truly are going to live up to that promise. And the problem that happens with this, now I'm going to shift over to the other side, is when you start using machines to start making automated decisions, you start making a deal with the devil. And the deal is, I'm going to give you more data. I'm going to give you more authority and autonomy to start making decisions on behalf of me. And that's where you know, industries like healthcare, and, uh, and I'll give you examples of where AI is beginning to get rogue if you don't apply it properly. So some of the questions that are coming up, and the questions that need to be answered are not the questions of, can I put AI to work? The question that needs to be answered is, can I trust AI? As I'm deploying this, as I'm consuming is the notion of trusted AI is going to be an incredibly important piece. By trusted AI, I mean, today, when you use a Waze, you assume that it is going to get me there on time. It is going to give me the best route. And you just have this bond and this expectation with the app. Can I do the same thing with an AI? I mean, if you look at a plane, most of the airplanes today, hundreds of millions of people put their lives in the hands of two actors with a hat on, sitting in the cockpit. You think they're flying it. They're not. right? It's an intelligent system that's flying the plane. And the actors are there to take on the plane and land it on a water, like Captain Sully did, if something goes wrong. So as you get more and more into this intelligence system making complex decisions, the humans in the loop are going to be there to start guiding. And that's where the question that needs to be asked by business schools and computer science schools and art school is, OK, what am I designing? Can I, can I trust this? Can I trust it to be beneficial and fair to everyone? I'm going to show you some examples of AI starting from how it's helping to how it's hurting. This is an example of a car crash. Okay. See the tone. Okay. So if you noticed a little bit on that, what happened was even before the accident happened, this is a movie that was taken in uh, Netherlands or somewhere, where the AI started alerting the driver to an accident that's coming up even before the accident happened. Watch it again. Okay. 
key that signal, right? What happened in that case was an AI, in this case, in a self-driving car, picked up a signal because it uses a technology called LiDAR that goes through bodies of cars where a human eye can't, and that signal went three cars ahead, and it found that there was a collision up front, and it came back. When I say Iron Man Jarvis suit, that's our Iron Man Jarvis suit for a driver. It's saying three cars ahead while your eye can't see it, I have detected a car accident, so you start paying attention. Right? This is an example when I say AI augmenting our capability. So the other example, again, I'm going to pick up the speed here a little bit around addressing major challenges. It's a video worth watching. idea, there is a tremendous amount of areas. There's not a single problem in the world that AI is not going to be impacting or affecting because this is around using intelligence at scale. Now, start moving to the other side. That's the good stuff. Now, let's start looking at the scary stuff. You see, thought fake news was bad. Watch till fake videos start taking place. What, what one of the researchers at a university, Carnegie Mellon, I think they did, is they took Barack Obama's video and started literally um, making the video and the face say things that he never said in his voice and his tone. It got and me you thinking this. about my full-time employees and their ability to survive on $8 an hour in New York City. And foremost in all of our minds has been the loss and the grief felt by the people of Orlando. Most of us don't get our health care through the marketplace. You watch me. We get it through our job or through Medicare or Medicaid. And what you should know is that thanks to the Affordable Care Act, your coverage is better today than it was before. Women can get free checkups, and you can't get charged more just for being a woman. To give his employees and together to pass a common there's a bill that would boost America's very, very hard times. Some progress, at least in, within the small confines of the legal community. I think it's real important. Uh, here we go. Uh, President Barack Obama, uh, when you're uh, giving a speech, uh, make sure you use uh, a lot of pauses. America's businesses have created 14.5 million new jobs over 75 straight months. We are developing technology. Every technology can be used um, in some negative way. And so we all should work towards uh, making sure that it's not going to happen. And uh, even um, one of the interesting directions is that once you know how to create something, you know how to reverse engineer it. And so I'm going to pause on that. So that, when you ask me what starts keeping me up at night, it is stuff like that. My insurance company, um, looks after all my stuff. Yeah, last month came to me and said, we have a new package for you, a cyber digital package. Uh, I said, what is that? They said, well, people could make a fake video of you in a compromising position and they may hold you for hostage and blackmail saying, you know, this is you in that hotel room where it's not you. And we have a package for you that will pay that blackmail off. I mean, you talk about that. They already have a product for stuff that they know is going to happen. So you talk about the disruption and the, the division and the destruction of lives that this stuff is going to start creating. And we're only just getting going with this, right? We're only in the first innings of, uh, of this whole thing. The other part now, AI harming life. How many of you heard of the Momo virus, right? Yeah, so some of you have. So Momo virus, let me actually just play the video. There haven't really been any other similar trends as extreme as Momo.
social networks and communication platforms have a responsibility? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold off on that. So that piece now, only about two months ago, one of my employees in London, uh, his nine-year-old son was playing a video game on YouTube or, or on online, and suddenly in the middle, his nine-year-old, there's a character who comes up and whacks off the head of, uh, and in a proper game. And that got hacked, and now there are video frames that are inserted that terrorize the hell out of that kid. So now we're getting to a place where audio, text, video, everything that we take as trustworthy is now, there's a death of truth. There's a death of privacy that we are entering into, and these are things that we need to worry about. Here are some examples of AI going wild again. Uh, Microsoft Taybot, they created this bot, and people hacked it by feeding it data that said the Holocaust never happened and Hitler was a great guy. And when people started asking it question, what do you think of Hitler? It would say he was a great guy, right? So shut the program down. Then Wikipedia right now has tens of thousands of bots that are fighting each other. As we speak, they're they are doing it. When someone goes in and says he was a terrorist, the other person says it's a freedom fighter. And these bots are now just replacing those entries to this endless battle that's going on. Facebook invented a chat bot to start messaging with us. After a few months, the bot invented his own language because human language is not as efficient as what the bots could figure out, freaked the hell out of Facebook and they shut the program down because how do you control something that's figuring out its own language that's not understandable to human beings? Uh, another one is, and this is a very common one, there is a soap dispenser, and in this case cameras, that doesn't dispense soap to a black hand, only dispenses it to white hands because the sensor and that AI model were trained using light color skin as the reflection of a hand. And now they're beginning, beginning to use those technologies to embed that into a heart rate monitor to detect a cardiac event. And imagine someone like me with a darker color skin, I get a cardiac event and that thing doesn't pick up. The implications of me and my family and the legal cost. So there are a lot of these things that are coming up that are really con concerning because people are building these things without thought and without design to the human implication of it. The other part, uh, there was a software company called Elite AI that built an AI and told it to compete against the human beings and figure out whatever you, know, you want to do to win against the humans. That AI went out and assembled weapons that the humans didn't even know were possible and took out all the human players within like a few minutes. Right? So these are the kinds of things when you allow machines to start going and I mean, I'm not uh, saying Terminator and all, it's, it's happening. The pieces of these are already beginning to happen and what's important is for us to be aware of it and make the right decisions in terms of how we guide and how we apply this. One of the times I spend these days, uh, the AI Global, the nonprofit I created, is because I'm spending time with the G7 and the D9 countries, because these countries are using automated decisions everywhere, and there is no transparency and visibility as to how these systems are making decisions. So that's an example, again, of these five dimensions, and this is the work I've been doing for the last two years in my nonprofit, around what are the five dimensions that needs to be controlled to create a responsible and ethical AI. And we call these the five dimensions, data rights, explainability, fairness and bias, robustness and compliance. I'm not gonna take you through all this, but enough to say, this I believe personally for me will be more important for my life than my work with IBM Watson, this work I'm doing right now. Because what I'm building here, and I'm open sourcing it, even though this was invented by my startup, Cognitive Scale, I've decided to open source it and give it away because think of it almost like a jiffy lube of AI, right? Where you drive in your car and it'll give you a stress test and a checkpoint and 21 point checklist on your car and it'll tell you how your AI is doing. So think of what we are doing here is building an AI that tests other AI and gives you a report card, like an underwriter's lab of AIs. And what I've done is I'm going to governments now and saying, I'll give you money, adopt it. I'll give you technology, adopt it. But make sure, so Canada is the first country that has now adopted this as part of the procurement policies. They have said that we will not buy IT from companies unless they pledge and align to this cognitive scale responsible AI framework. This is what I taught at University of Texas Austin, my first time ever teaching. Anuj was my coach. I, I called him up and said, I'm supposed to be teaching a semester on designing ethical AI systems. And uh, he was telling me how to teach. And uh, I was surprised by how much I learned myself and how much the students want to know about this stuff because they care. Stuff that we are building that worries me I have hope in this Gen Z and these millennials because they do care. They want to fix these things. And I think universities like this with the programs that you're building, which are modular and configurable, are the programs that are going to determine how we generate the next generation leaders. And that's one of the reasons I'm excited to be here and, and have this conversation. 
Um, so what we did, I'm going to just play this. Uh, Artificial we, we intelligence sandbox. is here to stay and is rapidly being adopted in virtually every domain, from healthcare to finance and public safety to entertainment, to name a few. AI systems often function in oblique, invisible ways that have led to anxiety about how AI may harm the most vulnerable and create unintended consequences. This has driven the need for building systems that take a people and values approach first and are bias-free and transparent in their operations. We call these responsible AI systems. Cognitive Scale has partnered with AI Global, University of Texas at Austin, USAA, IEEE, and other leading organizations to build a responsible AI framework and sandbox, which ensures that businesses and governments reflect their core values and ethics in their AI-powered systems. The five pillars of this framework are data ownership, explainability, bias and fairness, robustness, and compliance. For example, when applied to healthcare, care providers can use AI to identify patients who are at risk of faltering and risk of readmission, and then respond with better, faster, more accurate treatment protocols. AI systems built using responsible AI framework and tools give the care providers both recommendations as well as insights into how they reach their outcomes to enable human users to understand and trust their decisions. Similarly, in agriculture, an Asian startup is developing a family of AI apps to help farmers grow better crops given local soil quality, weather forecasts, and market demand for various commodities. Using responsible AI framework and tools, farmers are provided insights on what data sources were used by the AI system and how it made its decisions by processing various complex data streams comprising of time series data, text, and satellite imagery. To put Responsible AI into action worldwide, AI Global, Cognitive Scale, digital nations including the Government of Canada, and leading global brands are collaborating to build an open Responsible AI sandbox. It's an intelligent online service built around the five pillars of Responsible AI and serves as a guided algorithmic impact assessment tool geared towards mitigating the data, model, and system design risks associated with deploying AI systems. It's equipped with sample code and documentation to help members design AI systems that are fair, transparent, and accountable for everyone. Specifically, the Responsible AI Sandbox provides a guided assessment of the user's AI system design to identify how underrepresentation of data sets and misrepresentation of data could negatively impact individuals and segments of the public. Future enhancements will help provide transparency and explainability into how the AI system reached its outcomes, as well as provide the capability to input and test for local and regulatory ethical considerations around data usage, explainability, and robustness. I'm gonna just uh, pause on that, but you get a feel for what we're trying to do here. We're trying to build um, a sandbox where people can go get a report card on the kinds of AI they're building. One of the cases, UNICEF, came to us and said, there is a country that's building uh, an intelligent and AI-powered Barbie. And they're worried about what knowledge is Barbie gonna be fed, so that when she answers the questions, is it in compliance with the local ethics and the local values, or whatever they want that particular country's Barbie to say. It's almost like textbooks, right? There's a lot of battles over what goes into textbooks. So now, these are battles over new learning devices that are the intelligent interactive textbooks. So, but there is no parameters around how you train an AI to be uh, in a Barbie, right? So what we are building is we're building these tools to use AI to help build better AIs. Because right now the focus is a little too much on making money with AI and not thinking about what the societal input and impact of AI is. My worry is AI is gonna make the rich more richer and the evil more evil. And, and with the, someone now that I know that I can't double my age anymore, the runway is getting smaller, in shorter as 54 now. One of the worries I have is, what am I leaving behind? And uh, so that my grandkids don't look back and say, Grandpa did Watson, but how the hell did he miss this stuff? Right? So part of what we want to do, part of the partnerships uh, with folks like Anuj, is to get the word out now. Because this is not a Pandora's box. This is a Pandora's container, a shipping container that we have opened up. So there is no kill switch on this stuff. People are building this stuff on the cloud. Um, you know, for a thousand bucks a month, last year you got the compute capacity equals to an insect's brain in a laptop or in a cloud. This year for a thousand bucks a month, you get the compute capacity equals to a mouse's brain in a laptop. 
In seven more years, you'll get $1,000 a month, or in a $1,000 laptop, you get compute capacity equals to one human brain. And in 26 years, for $1,000 a month, compute capacity equals to all human brains combined. So now you've got compute that's pretty much you know, available to everyone. You've got connectivity everywhere. And imagine when people start building these intelligent systems that could start doing havoc. I was looking at a you know, semi-humorous example of the new Nigerian uh, scam now is fake pictures on Tinder, which starts connecting to a bot. So the bot starts interacting with the person with all the emotion and all, thinking that it's the, uh, you know, a man and a woman on the other side. And it's automated all the way down to a bank account in terms of what they ask for the money and how to be transferred. So Tinder is actually now looking for bots that are coming up as uh, people that don't exist, and it's automated the whole supply chain. So this is going to be all around us in how we educate, how we eat, how we drive. And uh, my purpose here for this talk was to start having a conversation with leaders like you and students like you to start thinking about how do we get this under control before we have our own version of Hiroshima's. Uh, there are going to be AI Hiroshima's. Um, Facebook, Facebook and the last elections were the first one. Uh, Brexit, if you haven't seen the documentary uh, on BBC, look at Brexit. This is absolutely about the same thing what we went through. Unfortunately, I think progress will come at expensive mistakes like that that will almost pull us apart as a society. And uh, my goal here is to sort of get the conversation going and get hopefully the curriculums going after that. So with that, uh, let me uh, invite my friend Anush back here and have a conversation on this. Thank you, Anush. Anush. Wonderful. Wow. Manoj, that was an excellent presentation. Um, there are so many things that, that I would like to go deeper into it, and there are some submitted questions that I want to ask as well. But let me first take you back to your Watson project. Uh, what was going on in your mind at that time? I imagine there was, I remember uh, you being very excited about leading that, leading that initiative, but I have always known you to be excited about anything that you do. Um, <laughs> What were the challenges that you were facing? And what were the te technical challenges that were there first? And how did you address those? You know, um, Watson was one of those um, moments in you know, history that always change you forever. So like when the mainframe was built, that changed the face of how you know, we worked as a society. Or when you know, uh, Gary Kasparov was beaten by a chess playing computer, the changes. So when I got the job, I think I had two two sentiments. One was incredible excitement, and second was uh, humility about how the hell do I go about this. So I used to tell the IBM CEO, Ginny Rometty, that every morning when I brush my teeth, half of my teeth and a face is like super excited, and the <laughs> other half of my face saying, how the hell are you going to commercialize this? So what we did there is I went back and studied what did IBM do with the last big innovation, which was the mainframe. Because the first job I had was to apply it into an industry. And what I learned was the mainframe was first applied by IBM, I don't know if you all know this, to do US census. The very first application of the mainframe for greater good of society was US census. So what I knew is that history was gonna judge me. And you know, and only in America can a kid from India be told, here are IBM's crown jewels, you know, go build a business. So I had that great sense of sort of, um, you know, privilege as well as an understanding about the decisions I take are going to be reflected back as to where was this put to work. So we chose cancer um, as one of the areas to put to work. And in the last seven years, we've learned many things, um, some that have worked, some that have not worked. Uh, there is a saying that the way to identify a pioneer is she's the one with the most arrows in her back, right? So, <laughs> so uh, you know, it's the, it's the frontier mindset. And we learned a lot while running IBM Watson by putting it to work for cancer. Probably the three biggest learnings were this. Uh, number one, is just a question answer technology is not enough. Uh, you need multiple reasoning types. Our human brain doesn't just use question answers, it also uses pattern matching, it uses rules. You know, my mom said if it's red and hot, don't touch it. And I take it as a rule. Um, and I know there is a correlation that if I cross the traffic light when it's red, I'm gonna get honked. I mean, there'll be a, so there is a pattern. And then, so there is, the one realization I had was Watson was just good at one type of learning. I need multiple orchestration engines. So that's why we started Cognitive Scale. We said Cognitive Scale will be this multiple reasoning engine. I can plug in different eyes and noses and mouth, and I can orchestrate that into a brain. So that was the first realization. The second realization actually happened out of DC. I was uh, taking Watson around to the 
uh, government, you know, the officials here and, and the senators and all. And we took it to a small school and there was this 10 year old girl who was very excitable and she was sitting in the front and she said, you know, excuse me, Mr. Can Watson tell me what question to ask? And I thought, you know, she's a kid, what does she know? I'm like, no, sweetheart, it doesn't work that way. As I was driving to the airport, the genius of that question hit me. And then I realized the real power of these systems is not about the known unknowns, it's the unknown unknowns. So there is three types of information in the world. There is stuff you know, some of which is wrong. Uh, there is stuff you know that you don't know. That's why you ask a question. Then there is stuff you don't know you don't know. So she was asking, can you build a machine that can tell me what I don't know? So the way I say that is, why is it that I had to ask Alexa the day after Brexit, tell me what happened? Alexa should tell me, good morning, while well, you went to bed, Brexit happened. You got a ton of money in Europe on these stocks. It's going to get impacted. <laughs> Shall I connect you to your financial advisor? Why do I need to ask Alexa? Why doesn't Alexa tell me? So I think that whole flipping of the arrow was the third part, uh, second realization. One is multiple reasoning engine. Second is augmented intelligence versus just automated intelligence. And third was that these things take a lot of time and they need to have trust built into them. So the first thing a doctor told me at MD Anderson was, it's one thing for the computer to say Toronto or whatever the answer, but it needs to give me the answer and the evidence as to why it came up with the answer it did. Because in a Jeopardy, you didn't need the evidence, but in a real life application, I need evidence. So those are kind of the three things that we have now parlayed into multiple applications and systems. But you know, those were early days. It's like the looking at the first Mac, you know, with all the guts hanging out and you know, that the Atari <laughs> or whatever. That's kind of how Watson was. Now it's not even like a MacBook. It's still like one of those old PCs. We still have a long way to go in this area. So where do you think it will go? Well, I think it's, um, so that's the part, right? That's the, that's the million dollar question. It will go wherever we decide as a society to make it go. It's the decisions, because I absolutely believe that technology by itself is neither good or bad. It's how we apply technology that really matters. Uh, if you look at internet, when the internet came about, do you all know what were the first two killer applications of the internet when it became commercial? Gambling? Porn. Porn. Exactly. So those were the first two killer applications on the internet, commercial internet, gambling and pornography. And then as a society, we started, decided, we started deciding where to put it to work for financial services, healthcare, and now you look at everything we do is connected to the web. So I think the same thing is going to happen with AI. Um, the decisions we make, and the difference with AI is this. These are exponentially learning systems. These are like nuclear power. This is like nuclear power. And when the nuclear power came about, when Hiroshima happened, what was the first response? The Geneva Convention happened where the countries agreed on how to use it properly. We need a Geneva Convention for AIs. And I think, unfortunately, we're going to have a couple more Hiroshimas before the countries will come to their senses and they will start regulating how to put this to work. So that's one direction. It's a given that your data and your AI explainability has to be controlled and regulated. The second thing it's going to do is going to create companies that are going to make Facebook look small. You know, within the next five to seven years, there'll be a hundred billion dollar AI company that's a startup today that will come about um, because they have figured out how to apply AI in a creative way. I mean, think about an Uber, right? What is an Uber? An Uber is a business model that uses mobile and cloud computing and machine learning and customer experience to build a whole new different business model. And with AI, we're going to have dozens of those companies. Uh, so there's never been a better time to be an entrepreneur and for schools like this to be teaching. Um, you know, I, use an, I love jazz, and I use the analogy of in the 1950s when the electronic keyboard was invented, jazz musicians had a massive outbreak of productivity because they could use the keyboard to create music at a level they couldn't create before. AI is the new jazz keyboard. Right? AI is going to create amazing amounts of creativity and it's going to create a lot of harm, and it's going to create new regulations. So I think it's going to be a combination of things and, and, and places like this. When I heard that you have a certification in AI, I was very curious as to what that includes in it. And I think these are the times where we need to get ahead of it and address all three parts, opportunity, risk, and regulation. 
So that's a great point, and what a great analogy there, Manoj. But you mentioned in your talk also about how we cannot leave this to AI, to, to technology, or to data scientists, and, yeah. and, and the business school, for example, has a big role to play. Yeah. Most business schools at this point are kind of thinking about how best to yeah. play a role in this AI. Yeah. So can you give us some more pointers as to what you think where a business school like ours should be doing, other than coming back with, of course, programs which are modular, which are market-driven, and things of that kind? And what can we be teaching to our students, yeah. which is going to be helpful for them to be prepared for this AI? Yeah. Well, I think you know the, the, the framework is the same. It happens with every new technology. So I call it educate, activate, and scale. Right? That's the three-step process. You got to first educate people as to what is AI and what is it not. So being able to look at AI, uh, so I was talking to one of the large bank CEOs, and he said to me, they spend $10 billion a year on IT. 10 billion, 10.6 billion on IT. And, and he said, AI is gonna transform Wall Street at a scale bigger than spreadsheets did, okay? So imagine if you have a student that was graduating 25 years ago from GW who said, I don't know how to use spreadsheets, right? They won't have an opportunity. So when people ask me, am I gonna be replaced by AI? I tell them, you won't be replaced by AI, but you'll be replaced by a person who knows how to use AI. So building skills in your students who know, and not just Python and stuff, how do I design an AI system for business outcomes? So looking at AI through a people and impact first lens and not a data and machine learning lens. If I look at Stanford, and MIT, and Carnegie Mellon, these are all brilliant schools. MIT put a, a billion dollar school on AI. A billion dollars, just for AI. 99% of these programs take a data and algorithms first approach. Where I think places like GW and University of Texas Austin should take a people and values first approach. We say, okay, how do I design this in a way that it impacts and affects the elderly? How does it impact someone who's in a socioeconomically backward area to get better resources? So I think that's, the framing is very important. So, so when people look at, when the machine learning people look at numbers, not, not to you know, pick on them, they look at arrays and matrices. When a social scientist looks at machine learning model, he or she looks at it as people and behaviors and lives. So you need more people looking at numbers as people and behaviors, not as arrays and matrices. And I think this is where the transformation starts. It starts here. That's great. So I'm going to uh, ask a couple of questions. And if there are audience questions, please uh, do line up. And we will take those questions as well. Um, but let me, let me ask you, you set up this foundation. Tell us a little bit more about the foundation and what, what was the it, what was the rationale behind it and what you are planning to achieve with it? Well, you know, I have this family foundation. It, it actually came out of two needs. One is the need of um, pragmatism. Another is the need of gratitude. Uh, I'll start with the gratitude first. You know, for a kid from India, when I came here in 1988, I took $14,000 in loan. I didn't want my parents to pay for it. And to look at all the blessings, to look at all the opportunities that this country has given me, I doubt if growing up in India, I would have been given all these opportunities. So a big part of me as, as this, my father used to say, an ungrateful life is a wasted life. So I have a lot of gratitude for all the blessings that I've been given. And I want to take this wealth and redistribute the wealth back because I've got way more money than my next seven generations will use. I want to put it to good use and only leave one house for each of my two daughters. The pragmatic need is if I leave them all this money, I'm going to mess up their lives. Because I believe the essence of life is struggle and, and growth. And if you get just enough money to say you got a roof over your shoulder, I mean, over your head, and rest of it you're on your own, I think that will make them to have a better life than me leaving a lot of money and then falling into bad habits or my future son-in-law sitting in first class and toasting <laughs> to me saying, thank, thank you, father-in-law, when I'm uh, dead and gone. Um, so I'd rather take that money and put their life to a better use to know that they have healthcare and, and, and a home, and then put this to work on three areas. Uh, one is empowerment of women. My mm -hmm. life has been changed by four incredible women, um, and, and I want that to be, and, and it's amazing that in this day and age, we have gender inequality. It's just insane, doesn't make sense. And as a father of two daughters, that's even more important for me to apply that, to make that. In fact, in, in AI, there was a study that was done that women have better digital skills than men. And women only represent 14% of the population in the tech industry. So it's, it's, it's just a no-brainer to put money around women's empowerment. Second is uh, prevention of sex trade in children. It's something which I think is aberrant 
and it's something that moves me at a personal level, so we're putting money on that. And the third is to educate our youth so they finish high school and they pursue technology careers, American kids. So all of this money, I, I, I like to say, I live here and I give here. So I got the money out of here, and the goal is to give this back to my daughters. And I told them, I'll give you the best gift, which is a gift of giving. For the rest of your life, you will be giving this stuff away. And I think so it's a, it's a, it's a combination of gratitude and pragmatism to keep my daughters on the straight and narrow. Uh, and, and then also to kind of put this money to good use. Well, I can't, I can't uh, argue with that. That's very clear. Clarity in thinking, and I share the two daughters' story with you, so there's, uh, there's certainly some commonality there. Let me, before I go to the questions from the audience, let me just ask one, one other question. As we graduate students, should they be fearing AI at this point, or should they be loving it? Because there's opportunity to really contribute, as you point out. Uh, yeah. This is a great time for entrepreneurship. And, um, and often, uh, uh, we have heard many times when a new technology comes in or when the new technology is being developed, the time it takes for it to really have the impact is longer than we estimate. Yep. And the impact that we estimate is usually smaller. Yep. So I don't know. You have said five to seven years, a lot of things are going to be happening. And yep. we heard it, and it was scary to hear some of that. What do you think at this point about that statement about AI and yeah. how it pertains Well, you know, I that? never wanted to be a 21-year-old as much as I do now. <laughs> uh, not because of, you know, health or whatever, but the opportunities to go change the world are so much. I mean, this is a phenomenal time to be a young person. Phenomenal time to also be an entrepreneur. And I think if I were a student coming out, if I have some of the insights I do now, I'd probably have, I would say, three things to them. Number one, like I said, AI is the new spreadsheet. AI is the new PowerPoint. Learn it, because if you don't have it, the, you're not going to be selected for the job. It's a very practical thing. It's like when I graduated, I used to say, I know MS Word and PowerPoint and Excel. <laughs> that was on my resume, right? So it's the same thing. Around AI, you need to be able to say, I know these things. So that's a tactical piece. Second part, and this is what gives me great hope, having taught this course at UT Austin, I really respect this generation so much for their heart and their humanity, way more than our generation did. I think. Uh, maybe I surround myself with the wrong people, uh, but, uh, but you know, they care a lot about, and they know we are leaving a society and an a earth back that is messed up, and there is a much more deeper sense of corporate social responsibility and do-goodness, so I think this will automatically attract uh, these students if you play it up to them and say, here are the things you could do. Use it as a weapon, use it as a creative tool. Uh, that's the second part. And third is, it's my hope that, you know, coming out of this place will be the future president of this country, will be a future, you know, like Colin Powell, there are many more of those to come out. Um, I think hopefully they start, at this young age, start making decisions about how to frame policies, how to start applying these things in a way that their resources are being applied to the right place, so that as a nation, I'm telling you, um, at the risk of sounding like an alarmist, AI is a threat to democracy. It absolutely is a threat to You saw that with Facebook. What it did is you replaced the algorithm, you replaced the human editor to give you a balanced view with an algorithm, and the algorithm was told, supply me the news that makes me click the most likes and stay on the Facebook application the longest. And what the algorithm did, what the AI did, is it made an echo chamber in your mind and started feeding you more and more of the stuff that you like and started highlighting the stuff that you hate, and it polarized us as a country. And that's what you saw in the last election. We got hacked. Our software in the brain got hacked by algorithms because we replaced newspaper editors with that. Imagine you start doing that. There is Department of Defense talking about using AI for autonomous warfare, for defense. Okay, what's the fine line between defense and offense? So my hope is that the policy making and those framing is what these students go out and start taking a view of AI that lives with the greatest principles of this country with our constitution and our belief as this country. So that to me will be the biggest gift, is to create future leaders who, who believe and retain and amplify what America is all about. Wow, beautifully said, Manoj. Um, so let me go to the questions as well. If you don't mind, uh, please state your name and uh, what you're doing here and, and, and ask your question is a, in as compact a form as you can. And please, do we have some time for questions? So if other people want to line up, please do. Hi, uh, thank you for coming today. My name is Alexander Ward, and I'm a senior here at GW undergrad. And I just wanted to ask you, clearly uh, you alluded to a bunch of times how financial services is going to be affected by artificial intelligence and everything involved. Could you maybe give a more concrete example of how this is going to play out? Yeah, uh, thanks Alex for the question. So, um, 
I think there are multiple parts. So every part of uh, financial services, everything from investment banking. So today, um, and I'm working with Barclays actually on this problem, where in order for someone like you graduating out of school to get the research quality insights about market movements, banks are not able to provide it to you because you need to have a net worth of a million pounds or more. But now imagine they create a ways-like application that in the palm of your hand starts telling you that I'm reading 12,000 news sources, I'm looking at your portfolio of stocks, I'm looking at what you told me you like, and it starts acting like your personal advisor in a pocket. Right? That's one example of helping you make better decisions with your money. That's one. Second is if you're a trader, if you're a derivatives trader, and if I am doing the trading, and AI can be looking at multiple trades that are going on, billions of dollars in a day or in an hour, and it will tell you that this particular deal, I've watched 700 more transactions in the last hour and a half. If you drop the price by 0.2 basis points, the chances of you winning goes up by 94%, and the net profit for you is $400,000 on it. So the decision-making capability for the human to start saying, as I'm doing derivative trading, can be completely changed. Um, if I have bad debt collection, if I'm a credit card company, every year, every month I get 300,000 records where I have to decide whether I turn it to a collection agency or whether I you know, give them a pass on it. And in most cases, I sell that debt. And AI can tell me, what is the quality of the debt? That particular person, Manoj, he actually was traveling this month and typically he's good at it, so give him a pass on it. So getting better understanding of the quality of debt. So every aspect, I can go on and on, underwriting, claims, um, you know, marketing, all of these things are gonna be transformed by AI. Is it gonna be sort of a more extreme gap though? Go to the mic, please. Oh. Will there be more of an extreme gap though between maybe the haves and have nots? Because like you said, you're working with Barclays, right? Now the traders have obviously extreme, like, a better understanding of where the deal is going, or you know how to get that arbitrage, versus someone who's at their home, like in their home, just trying to make you know a little bit of <clears throat> extra cash. They're really going to be beats out of that market. Yeah, you know, I think it's going to happen at both levels. I mean, this is my worry, but also I think there's opportunity there. Um, I mean, if you look at Uber, right, the number of Uber jobs that exist today uh, that never existed in the back because technology got a new job. Now you could argue they're not the best quality job. Number of Zumba instructors. Who would have thought of Zumba instructors as a job? Or, or Peloton bicycle you know, trainers. These are the new kinds of jobs that will come about. But at the high level, I do believe that it is going to make the rich more richer. Uh, and that's one of my biggest worries about AI. It's not that making money is bad, but I think using it in a more proportionate way, I think, is where the current issues are. Hey, one last thing. Uh, do you think that people might sort of aggregate cash and put their assets more into these centralized places now because they have this inherent advantage? You know, that, uh, that depends on <laughs> what segment you, you, know, you are. So if you have a family office, it's a long answer, but I would say it will democratize investing. It will make more information available for people to make better decisions about their money than is available today at a Thank broader you. level. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, thanks so much for coming today. My name is Dominic Seguera. I'm currently a senior in the business school. I am actually uh, working for IBM when I graduate, so I'll be happy to join your team there. Congratulations. Uh, my question is really about the impact of AI on healthcare, specifically in uh, low-income areas. You know, there's a lot of uh, problems with you know getting a doctor, putting all that time in, and then moving, you know, to, let's say, Kansas, Nebraska, Indiana, Ohio, one of these, you know, more Middle Eastern or uh, Western states. Do you think that AI can empower nurse practitioners to serve kind of the full suite of medical um, offerings that a doctor can offer? And how do you think that will improve the quality of care in addition to the cost of, of great, healthcare? Great question. And, you know, healthcare and education are the two biggest trillion dollar economies that I think AI will impact. I mean, we spend 20% of our GDP on healthcare as a country. I think, um, so the short answer is absolutely yes. I think, but let me kind of unpack it a little bit more. I think there are a few trends that are going on that AI will definitely uh, make a massively, I think, positive contribution, starting with the home healthcare. So more and more care is now being provided at home. As the population gets older, uh, these, these things are now being pushed out to the home centers. So imagine having an Alexa that can start guiding you on medicines to be taken, or you have a sensor, and if you fall down, Alexa will say, do you want me to call the nurse for you? So I think you know, the 
The world is going to become our browser and we will become the cursor. Our voice will become a cursor. So you will have intelligence surrounding you, so it will take care of you in a better way if you are you know, staying by yourself or if you are someone who doesn't have access to medical knowledge. That's the one part. The second part is uh, it will democratize, like in financial services. AI has already proven to read uh, X-ray images with better accuracy than uh, some of the even you know, top radiologists. And I think imagine if you're able to now create a business model that says, I'm getting a mark here. It looks like carcinoma or not. You take a five photograph and send it to an AI for $9.99. It'll tell you whether how fast you should go to the doctor or not. Right? So there are the kinds of things that I think AI will democratize. There are other things like uh, home health and others where the regulations have to change a little bit. Telemedicine and stuff, I think countries like China and Africa, they will adopt it in a much faster rate than the US will because we have the legacy infrastructure to deal with. Just like with phones. In India, I remember it used to take me six months to get a phone when I was growing up. Plus, because my mom was a doctor, we got it in one month because she was a doctor. It's a high value thing. Then they went from there to the world's most advanced cell phones. I go there, I could combine any <laughs> SIM card with any phone, and I'm connected to the whole world. I think the same thing's gonna happen in healthcare. You're gonna see a democratization of healthcare being picked up and new models coming out of it. That's very interesting. So what do you think would be the best healthcare infrastructure that a country could build, you know, <laughs> based on this AI? What How would much that time do you like? have? <laughs> uh, well, I think, you That's know, a deep so question. I'll, I'll answer it in a couple of ways. Um, first of all, there's a lot of online stuff, and I, and I know this industry, but no, nowhere near. So Atul Gawande is a good guy. He's written a couple of good books. You should read up on that. Um, I think there are a couple of things. One is there are structural issues that we have as a country around this whole payer provider network. Um, that is like gutting out the whole system that was built 100 years ago, and you've seen the politics around it. So it's a, uh, it's, it's a structural issue that we have that we need to fix as a country, and I don't know what it will take. But if you look at new countries that are coming online, where they have a chance to design and redesign their healthcare system, I think they would build it to be a cloud-centric, mobile-driven, trust-based care, where we will, I think, plot our way through one claim at a time and one you know, benefit at a time. Uh, so it's gonna go at different paces. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hi, my name is Hugh Livingood, uh, GW MBA, class of 2012, and been working with IBM for the past seven years now. Oh, and I'm just saying, delighted, thank you so much. All of the topics that you're raising are still at the forefront of what we're experiencing and the challenges we're facing. I'm particularly curious to hear your thoughts on liability and responsibility across the automated, autonomous, and augmented spheres. Because even though I'm incredibly excited for the future of AI, I think that determining liability and responsibility as we progress along is going to address a lot of the risks and concerns that we feel as users and then determine okay. so many other parts. Absolutely. Oh, no, great question. And, and, and thank you for asking that. At the end of the day, I think um, this is all about trust. At the end of the day, you're building a digital brain that's representing your company, right, versus a human brain behind a phone. Now, people will expect your digital brain to behave as well as the human brain does. So if you have a chatbot, you can't have the chatbot be a Nazi chatbot. That's why Microsoft shut it down. So I think as we put more and more digital agents out there, the need for them to be transparent, auditable, and trustworthy will be very high, or they will be very high damage to the brand. Microsoft in Q4 announced in the annual report that AI is a risk to their business, that the Microsoft stock may fall because of unintended consequences from AI. I think every company is gonna announce that. So, so that's one part is this, the smarter companies will say, I'm gonna use this to improve my brand trust and not get caught like Facebook did. That's one piece. So trusted AI is gonna be a big deal. The second part is, I think autonomous AI is overrated. I think self-driving cars are overrated. Um, I think it's not because they can't work. You know, I could, and it's been proven, I can take a spray can and only change 2% of a stop sign and make the smart car read it as a yield sign, okay? I can paint stripes on the road um, that will make the thing merge into another lane. And, and, and there, I mean, if you are a terrorist, you don't need to be doing nasty things. You can just go stand in the middle of the highway with a stop sign, right? And imagine what happens to your self-driving cars. So there's a lot of stuff like this that has not been thought through or an autonomous. And that's why I say on an airplane, 
you know, that the human in the loop is an incredibly important part of any decision. So I do think the biggest opportunity is in the automated and, and augmented. Autonomous, I think, will happen in some pockets, like drones and stuff like that. And also in countries like Middle East and stuff, where they can have an autonomous helicopter because there's not a whole lot of people around it and stuff. So it'll happen in niches. But the biggest opportunity is augmented. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. We have a couple of minutes, so let's try and squeeze in two quick questions, if you may. Okay. I'll make it quick. Thank make you so much for too. being here. Um, I'm Rena uh, in the MBA program here at GW. And like you mentioned, one of the big challenges of AI right now is the biased data that we're feeding into these systems, biased historic data. Um, so can you speak a little to what AI responsible sandbox is doing to tackle this challenge? Yeah, great question. So bias is one of the hardest things to solve because uh, research has proven that our current systems are very biased. And it's very hard to sort of make it completely unbiased. What we're doing at AI Global to your thing is we have picked out two models that are fairness and bias assessment models. And we have found it to be the best in class. And we help people do like a TurboTax flow check on their AI. And based on what the problems are in the AI, we guide them to the right models and say, follow these steps to reduce the bias in your, in your AI system. So we're essentially creating prescriptions uh, based on uh, a diagnostic question that someone answers. And then we're guiding them down a path. So think of us as we are creating AI auditors. Right? We're using AI to audit AI. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So one final question. Hi, um, my name is Ileana mayfeld Carucci. I'm finishing my master's degree in data science here. Currently work as machine learning engineer actually on some model, um, sorry, media manipulation stuff that you talked about. Uh, my question is, um, you referenced earlier about how Facebook's algorithm is creating an echo chamber um, and that increases divis divisiveness and they're kind of prioritizing their profit currently over ethics. Um, and yet we kind of live in a capitalist society um, and AI is currently being adopted um, and adopted for for-profit ventures at a fastly, faster rate than um, mm -hmm. not-for-profit and social ventures. Yeah. So how can we reconcile the drive for profit with ethics and AI and do you think they can coexist? No, oh, I think right on. So one of the things I love about this series is it's sponsored by the Corporate Social Responsibility Group. I do believe that CSR in companies is going to change quite a bit. Uh, this notion of doing well by doing good. And money will still be the main topic. I mean, money will still be the main goal for business. But I think investors and, and customers will soon start judging companies based on how it is. There's a reason people don't buy or didn't buy from Nike because of the sweatshops in China. Soon, there will be the AI version of it. You know, your generation will stop buying products. There will be digital demonstrations online because of a fairness issue that an AI had with a soap dispenser, and they will discount and not buy Procter & Gamble, they'll have flash mobs on top of it. So there's a whole new set of digital experiences, good and bad, that are gonna pressure boards and companies to realize that good AI is good business. And I think that's where it'll finally settle. But in between, there'll always be bad actors. In between, there'll always be the Gordon Geckos, you know, greed is good. And, uh, but I still believe in the American dream. I still believe that after hitting the guardrails a few times, in about 20 years, we'll, we'll find the right equation. Awesome. Well, that's Thank a great, so great time to stop. Uh, that's a perfect note to stop. Thank you very much, Manoj. What an what a entertaining conversation and the talk today. Thank you. Thank you again. And thank you all for joining us today as well. George Talks will continue on Monday, April 15th. And we have actually two sessions planned next week. The, our guest at noon will be Doug Zarkin. Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer, Pearl Vision Luxottica. He will be speaking on building omni-channel brand loyalty and advocacy in the age of Amazon. And in the evening at 6 p.m., we will host John Miller, Hall of Fame broadcaster. John will talk about the state of baseball. We look forward to seeing you then. Until then, have a great time.